She's like a sickness in my brain A vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way her body moves me The way she grabs me and intoxicates Until the signals in my mind Forget to operate Everybody and welcome back to my channel today we're doing a coffee and crime time and I don't even know how to prepare you for this one today's case is one that I've been seriously invested in for the better part of this week usually when I'm doing my coffee and crime times it takes me a day or two tops three to research it and put together notes because they're usually ongoing so anything that's happening there's not enough information to really do a full deep dive and that's why coffee and crime times are you know typically shorter than our usually long form videos but this one i could not stop digging and the more i searched the more I found and the more my mind was blown. This case involves multiple people who mysteriously died in a very short time period. It spans multiple states. Ultimately though, as interesting and sensational as this case can get, the bottom line is there's two children involved who are missing. These two children haven't been seen in months and the police believe that their lives are in danger. At the end of the day, raising awareness for this story is the main goal spreading it as far as possible and hoping that it might trigger something in somebody. Maybe they've seen these kids or maybe they will see them. It's difficult to find a starting point with this case and that was honestly the most challenging thing for me when I was putting together my notes. But for the purposes of trying to put everything together and give it to you in the most easily comprehensible format, I'm gonna start with the death of a woman named Tammy Daybell, who, according to her obituary, died peacefully in her sleep on October 19th in Rexburg, Idaho, a city where the majority of the population are members of the LDS church. Tammy was married to a man named Chad Daybell. Now, Chad's an author, and he's written many books for followers of the Mormon religion, fiction and nonfiction alike. And in the news, he's been described as a doomsday writer, having published 25 books on prepping for the apocalypse. It seems he was also very interested in near-death experiences and spiritual visions. His choice of subject matter is less important than what he went on to do two weeks after his 49-year-old wife died unexpectedly. Now you should know this was his wife of 20 years. They had five children together. They have a long history. But two weeks after she was buried, he remarried a woman named Lori Vallow. And they began to live together in the home that he and Tammy had previously shared. Now this might simply be a decision made in bad taste. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't do it, but some people do. Everybody grieves in their own way. When Tammy died, Chad seemed thoroughly distressed. He said that she'd seemed fine, and then one night she went to bed in a coughing fit, and she just never woke up. He declined having her autopsied, and the local coroner determined that her death was due to natural causes. And if nothing else suspicious had happened before or after this, that might have been it. However, Chad's new wife, Lori, seemed to have an unfortunate past as well. Her own husband, Charles Vallow, had been killed just months before, on July 11th, and the person who killed him was Lori's own brother. And then a few months after Tammy died in October, Alex himself was found dead in his home on December 12th. That's a lot of unfortunate, tragic, and mysterious deaths to happen in one person's life, especially if you know that Tammy's husband prior to Charles Vallow, a man named Joseph Ryan, had died just eight months before Charles, from a heart attack. Let's quickly unpack the relationship between Charles Vallow and Lori Vallow in hopes of better understanding what happened. Before he died, Charles Vallow had claimed that Lori had begun to change. And he attributed this change with her involvement in a religious group, an offshoot of the LDS church. Now in the media, it's being called a cult, 
Personally, I don't like to use that term until I, I know everything about the group, and it's really hard to know everything about this group, but for the sake of trying to be respectful to everybody's different beliefs, I'm not going to call it a cult, but when someone in the story or involved in the case refers to it as a cult, I will be saying cult in order to just keep it true to, you know, what's happening. Now, this group calls themselves preparing a people, and their focus is essentially just what, what they say it is. It's preparing their people, their followers, for the apocalypse, the end days. In January, just six months before he died, Charles said that Lori had told him she was a translated being who cannot taste death, and that she was sent by God to lead the 144,000 into the millennium. She'd also told Charles that if he got in the way of her mission, she would murder him and an angel would help her dispose of his body. Now, Charles' sister, a woman named Kay Woodcock, says that during this time period, her brother was terrified. And in February, he filed for divorce and he also took out an order of protection. He unsuccessfully tried to get the authorities to place his wife, Lori Vallow, on a 72-hour mental health hold after claiming she stole $35,000 from a joint bank account. They didn't do that even though I feel like it probably should have been considered because of the things that she was saying. A translated being who cannot taste death, she'll murder anybody who gets in the way of her goal and then an angel will help her dispose of the body. These aren't things that somebody says when they're, they're mentally right, in my opinion. But they, they didn't do it, and in the end, what Charles was most worried about was the kids. Lori was in custody of two children, 17-year-old Ty Lee, the daughter of Lori's ex-husband, Joseph Ryan, who died of a heart attack in 2018, and seven-year-old JJ, the adopted son of Lori and Charles. Now, the origin story of how JJ came to be adopted by Charles and Lori can get complicated, but I'll try to explain it as best I can. It seems that Kay Woodcock, Charles's sister, had a brother who was involved with a woman that had a drug problem, and this woman gave birth to JJ. Since the environment wasn't ideal for raising a child, and JJ was born with special needs, Kay and her husband Larry took the child in. Enter Charles and Lori, who are married and have been wanting a baby, but haven't been able to conceive. Now, Charles decides to adopt JJ, this way they can start their family, and JJ can remain close to Larry and Kay, who loved him very much. At first, Lori was a great mother, and she took good care of JJ, and she seemed to care for him. But two years ago, when she became involved with that religious group, things began to change. Charles's sister, Kay, said, quote, to think that within the last two years, she has completely changed into a monster. I'm making an understatement. Something happened to her. She just turned off, and once she got involved with that cult with Daybell, she just turned off the person we knew and went away. And the petition for divorce that Charles filed showed that Lori was slowly losing touch with reality. It claimed that she'd recently become infatuated, sometimes even obsessed, with spiritual visions and near-death experiences. She told Charles that she'd lived numerous lives on numerous planets. One of these lives was a woman named Mary French. Now, Mary French was the granddaughter of Joseph Smith Jr. Joseph Smith Jr. was the founder of the Mormon and LDS religion. On January 30th, during a phone conversation between Lori and Charles, while Charles was away on a business trip, Lori kept calling him Nick Schneider. And finally he was like, who's Nick Schneider? Like, it's me. And she said to him, Nick Schneider is the name of the person who stole your identity. So Nick Schneider is the person I'm talking to on the phone right now, you're not Charles. She claimed that this Nick person had killed Charles and stolen his identity. And that's when she told Charles that when he got back from his business trip, she was going to kill him and ruin him financially, which if you're dead, I don't think it matters if you're financially ruined, but okay. Charles, he really just didn't think anybody would believe him. It was all too crazy. Now, Charles, he was a very wealthy man, you know, well-respected businessman, well-respected in his community, um, strong family ties, and he just, he didn't know what to do. He was scared for himself, for Lori, for the kids. Larry Woodcock said sometimes Charles would call him at night on the phone and just sob. Kay Woodcock said that in 2018, she and Lori had a conversation, and in that conversation, Lori admitted to having been married several more times than anybody knew. She'd been married allegedly three other times before Charles, and Kay Woodcock started to wonder if she was a black widow of sorts. So you heard me say that Lori changed when she became involved with the cult and with Chad Daybell. So yes, that's right, Chad Daybell was also involved with this group. 
And it seemed at the same time that Lori was pulling away from her husband and her kids and her family, she was getting closer to Chad and his beliefs months before her husband or his wife died. And now both Tylee and JJ have gone missing and nobody has seen or heard from them since September. Let's go back really quick and go over the timeline. It's gonna make more sense. And I understand there's a lot of people involved in this. Like I said, there's a lot of people. It just, it's so hard to keep track of. It's so hard to understand the connections sometimes, but they're all connected. And that's what, that's what makes us crazy. So on July 11th, 2019, Charles Vallow, who'd already moved out of state, he comes back to pack up some things, get his stuff, and he goes to Lori's house to pick up JJ. While he is there, allegedly, an argument ensues. And allegedly, he hit Lori's brother, Alex, over the head with a baseball bat. And then in response, Alex shot him. The police decided that it was self-defense and no arrests were made, which is a little crazy to me because I, I get it, it could have been self-defense, but if somebody shoots somebody else after being hit on the head with a baseball bat, I still feel like some kind of investigation needs to happen, right? Like m maybe check it out, see if there's a motive, especially when you're, you're in a, a situation where there may be a custody battle or there may be some um, marital issues. In this case, there was both of them. And there are reports that both Tylee and JJ were present at the house when this all happened. And when Charles arrived, Lori asked the two of them to go outside. They heard gunshots and then she came out and drove them to school before calling 911. Now, during the month of August, both Kay and Larry would talk to JJ on FaceTime, but that'd be the last time that they'd see him or hear his voice. Because later that month, Lori took her two kids and moved to Rexburg, Idaho, where Chad Daybell was living with his still alive wife. Now that we're in Rexburg, um, JJ's enrolled at school, but September 23rd, 2019 was the last time he attended school. And this would be the last time that either Tylee or JJ were seen. On October 2nd, a man named Brandon Bordeaux was shot at while driving home from the gym. Now, Brandon was married to Lori's niece, a woman named Melanie, and they had four children together. Brandon and Melanie had what he thought was a great marriage. They loved each other, they loved their kids, they were looking forward to their future. But then one day, Melanie started spending a lot of time with her Aunt Lori and this religious group. Suddenly, over the summer, she told Brandon that she wanted a divorce. And a few weeks after her divorce went through, she was remarried to another member of this alleged cult. So when Brandon was shot at in this drive-by shooting, he was obviously terrified. The bullet missed his head by just a few inches. So he immediately went into hiding with his four kids in a different state. I believe that he is still in hiding. However, the police did investigate and Brandon was able to describe the Jeep that had carried the person who'd shot at him. And it turned out that this Jeep was registered to Charles Vallow, who by this time is already dead. Now there's reports that this Jeep was the one Tylee would often drive, but Tylee hadn't been seen since September and we're in October now. So it's kind of an easy next step to understand that if it's not Charles driving the Jeep because he's dead and it's not Tylee because she's been missing since the month prior, who else would have a set of keys to that vehicle? Fast forward to a week, exactly a week later, Tammy Daybell arrives home and she's um, emptying the back seat because she's got groceries and suddenly somebody shoots at her with what she thought was a paintball gun. She wrote about this experience in a neighborhood Facebook group and I'm gonna to read to you what she said in that post. She said, something really weird just happened and I want you to know so you can watch out. I had gotten home and parked in our front driveway. As I was getting stuff out of the back seat, a guy wearing a ski mask was suddenly standing at the back of my car with a paintball gun. He shot me several times, although I don't think it was loaded. I yelled for Chad and he took off around the back of my house. Now, Tammy reported this to the police, but it seemed like at the end, both she and the police probably thought this was some sort of sick prank. And the masked man was never found. But Kay Woodcock, Charles's sister, she sees this a little bit differently and she has her own theories about what happened that day. She said, quote, that wasn't a paintball gun. The fact that he pulled the trigger twice and it didn't do anything is because it misfired. Otherwise, she'd probably have been dead that day. So this weird incident with the, the guy in the ski mask and the paintball gun that maybe wasn't a paintball gun, this happened on October 9th and by October 19th, Tammy Daybell was dead. 
Her father, who had just seen her two weeks previous to her death, said that she seemed completely happy and healthy. She was dancing around the living room. She was normal. She hadn't been sick. She hadn't had any pre-existing medical conditions. She was a normal, healthy 49-year-old woman. I want to talk a little bit about Tammy Daybell before we move on because often the victims get lost in the shuffle and uh, they are often forgotten when the case is discussed. And I think Tammy's story is very important to what, what ended up happening. So Tammy was originally from Pasadena, California. She was a charter member of the Mentally Gifted Students program at her elementary school, and she exhibited great creative thinking skills. Her family moved to Utah when she was 13, and she played the drums and the clarinet in her high school band. She was even the editor of the paper her senior year. She loved books, she loved reading, she loved classical musicals, she knew all the words to her favorite songs. For college, she enrolled at Brigham Young University, and it was there during her freshman year that she met Chad Daybell. They quickly fell in love and got married on March 9th, 1990. While Chad continued his education, she worked as a secretary to support them financially, and she developed an interest in family history and genealogy. When they moved to Ogden, Utah, she became a stay-at-home mom, and she took great pride and pleasure in putting her focus on her children. She would take them to the library often to pass on her love of books. She cooked beautiful meals for them. She was a really good mom. And later, after they returned to Springville, Utah, she became a computer teacher at Art City Elementary. And in 2004, she and Chad founded Spring Creek Book Company, where she acted as CFO and designed book covers. Now, the website for this company, it's unavailable now, but it seems like they just published books from Mormons. Tammy was very active in the LDS church, very active in her children's lives. She just seemed like a really good person. She loved animals, especially Indian duck runners. If you look at her Facebook, she's got pictures of them. She's very proud of them. She raised ducks and pigeons and rabbits, and she gave every single one of them a name. She was warm, kind, happy, the kind of person that would give you their last dollar or the shirt off their back. And she was a whiz on the computer. She's been described as being like a computer genius. And that's why she took to, um, you know, creating the book covers for the books that she and Chad would publish in their company because she was really good at that stuff. And now she's gone, died from natural causes. Was her death actually from natural causes or is there something more nefarious afoot? I'll let you decide, we'll discuss it, but let's move on for now. So a few weeks after Tammy was laid to rest, Chad and Lori got married. And this obviously raised some red flags for people. Not only that, but Charles's family, who were out of state, they were getting more and more worried about where Tylee and JJ were. And because of that, on November 26th, the police arrived at the home that Chad and Lori shared to do a welfare check on JJ. Lori claimed that she'd sent him to Arizona to visit with some family there, and so the police were like, okay, and they left to go check out that story, and by the way, that story ended up being false, spoiler alert. So the next day they returned, obviously, with more questions like, why did you lie to us about the whereabouts of your seven-year-old son? And Chad and Lori had left. They'd fled, they'd gone. The police believe they left the state of Idaho completely. So obviously, now things are looking more and more suspicious. We have two children who've disappeared and were never reported missing by their mother or their new stepfather. We have two people, the spouses of Chad and Lori, who have recently, within a few months of each other, died. And this prompted an investigation to be reopened into the death of Tammy Daybell, and her body was exhumed on December 11th. They wanted to perform an autopsy on her, an autopsy that Chad Daybell had declined when she had initially died. They wanted to perform this autopsy to see if she really had died of natural causes. That brings us to December 12th, the day after the investigation is opened into Tammy's death. And Alex Cox is found dead in his home. Now remember, Alex Cox is the brother of Lori Vallow, and he's also the one who killed her estranged husband, Charles Vallow. And because all of these things are happening in different states, you know, Alex dies in Arizona and Tammy Daybell's being exhumed in uh, Idaho, it's kind of like far apart. So not everybody's putting the connection together yet, but it is suspicious that the day after they exhumed Tammy's body, Alex is dead. Now let's talk about Alex Cox quickly. It seems like Charles Vallow, Lori's ex-husband, who Alex shot, never trusted Alex, didn't really like him, and obviously for good reason. And Alex seemed to not have a great track record with the husbands of his sister. On August 5th, 2007, he'd been arrested for assault with a deadly weapon because he'd attacked Lori's ex-husband, Joseph Ryan, outside of the courthouse during a custody dispute with a stun gun. 
Additionally, allegedly, it's suspected that Alex was the one who was in the Jeep when the attempt was made on Brandon Bordeaux's life, also in Arizona. Additionally, it has also been speculated that he may have been the masked man who approached Tammy Daybell when she was taking the groceries out of her car and tried to shoot her. It is very possible that it wasn't a paintball gun he was holding, but as Kay Woodcock speculated, a real gun that just didn't fire. Now, two weeks after Brandon was shot at, Melanie, his ex-wife and Lori's niece, she texted Brandon and she said she decided to move from Arizona, where they lived, where Alex Cox also lived, and she was going to move to Idaho, where Chad and Lori lived. The death of Alex Cox is also really strange and mysterious. I am pretty sure there's not any details being released because of the fact that it's, it's part of an ongoing investigation, but nobody said how he died or if anything was found in his system or if he was autopsied. So we'll wait to see if that comes out, but it's suspicious. It does seem odd. I mean, Alex Cox was one of the witnesses, one of the few witnesses that was present when Charles Vallow was shot and killed. Once Alex was gone, the only two remaining witnesses that were alive were JJ and Tylee, and they've gone missing. Reports have come out claiming that Lori was telling people that Tylee was dead and that she'd been dead for several years. Also, reports came out saying that Chad had told people that his new wife Lori didn't have any minor children. So where is Tylee? Where is JJ? JJ has medication he has to take every single day, and the police have checked and that prescription hasn't been filled by any pharmacy. On January 2nd, the police executed a search warrant at the home of Chad Daybell. This came on the tail of Tammy Daybell's body being exhumed. The results of the autopsy have now been revealed, but I suspect whatever it was they found gave them probable cause for that search warrant. The goal would have been to go into the house and find anything that could have been used to kill Tammy, and the police are tight-lipped about it, but they revealed that they've collected evidence and they've sent it out to be processed and examined by experts. So pretty much they, they exhumed her body on December 11th, and um, you know they said it was going to take probably three weeks to a month to complete the autopsy, and we're here at the end of the first week in January, so it, it most likely has already been completed, and that's why I said I suspect whatever they found in that autopsy gave them what they needed to get a search warrant to go into Chad's home. And then while they were there, they'd be looking for anything that she might have taken or been given that could have caused her death based on the autopsy results. And at this time, we have no idea where Chad or Lori are. They've completely disappeared. They're off the map. But they are communicating through a lawyer, a lawyer that they hired in Rexburg, and here's his statement. Chad Daybell was a loving husband and has the support of his children in this matter. Lori Daybell is a devoted mother and resents assertions to the contrary. We look forward to addressing the allegations once they have moved beyond speculation and rumor. So essentially what this lawyer is saying, right, is we're not going to dignify these allegations with a response because at this point you have no proof. You have no evidence that Chad and Lori did anything wrong. So why would we even entertain these accusations when you have nothing on us. And I get it, that makes sense. If they're not guilty, if they're completely innocent, and they have nothing to do with any of these things, if this is just a, a series of unfortunate events and they know it looks bad, they might want to avoid being taken in and questioned and you know possibly implicating themselves in something they didn't do. I guess if I was innocent of all of these crazy things, I would maybe do the same? No. And at this point, law enforcement has come out and said that uh, Chad and Lori aren't suspects. They're just people of interest. But they would really like to talk to them and get an idea of where these two kids are that have literally not been seen since September. However, a man named Greg Scordis, who's a defense lawyer, that he's, he's not attached or affiliated with the case at all, but he has his own ideas about why the police haven't named them as suspects or arrested them. He believes that the police do have enough to arrest the couple, but they strategically have decided not to. Instead, they focused on collecting evidence to bring homicide charges, which is very sad, very scary. And Rexburg PD has stated time and time again that they believe JJ and Tylee's lives are in danger and they've asked the public for help in locating these children. But there is someone, someone who seems to know um, a little bit about where the kids are. This is a woman named Julie Rowe. And Julie is an author and a public speaker who was excommunicated from the LDS church due to her radical views. She claims to have entered the spirit world in 2004, where she was shown Earth's past, 
present, and future, and these events would be glorious and tragic. According to Julie, in 2004, she was a happy wife and mother when her health suddenly took a turn for the worse and she had a near-death experience. When her spirit left her body, she was greeted by a man or another spirit named John, and John showed her all sorts of historical things, past and present. He, he showed her to Adam and Eve and Moses, and she saw future things happening like earthquakes and the world ending and, you know, stuff like that. She claims that Chad Daybell is being mischaracterized in the media, much the same as she was. She said that Chad was her publisher and close friend, and they'd been in, you know, constant contact since um, February of 2014. But they didn't meet in person in February or the following months. They only met in spirit form. She didn't actually meet Chad in person until she visited him in uh, July of 2014, and that's when she met his wife. Now here is where things get a little sketchy because the wife she was meeting was Tammy Daybell, right? Tammy's still alive in 2014. Lori's not in the picture yet, maybe, who knows? But this Julie woman, she meets Tammy and she said that immediately upon meeting Tammy, she had a vision. During this vision, her angels on the other side of the veil told her that at some point in the future, Tammy would be going to the other side. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just have to shake my head a little bit here because this is no great revelation, right? We all die. It's one of those things that you can be certain of in life we all die. So she's not some great psychic or spirit traveler here when she's getting visions saying that at some point this person is going to, to go to the other side. We all go to the other side at some point, but okay, let's keep going. Anyways, Julie claims she never mentioned this revelation to Chad, but that later he came to her and he told her he'd also had the same message from the other side of the veil that his wife would be passing to the other side at some point. This news that the light side had given him made Chad incredibly sad. He was grieving about it and Julie tried to help him by doing some energy work, you know, clearing his emotions. Now, I, I try to keep an open mind about these sorts of things. I try to keep an open mind about everything. I don't necessarily believe that angels or spirits visit us and give us some intel that nobody else knows on the future or the past but I'm not going to discount that some people may believe that it happens to them. It's just never happened to me. If you believe that you've had visions that give you insight into yourself, your life, or the world, then you do you. That's cool. Whatever you need to live your life in a fulfilling manner. But this woman is essentially saying that she and Chad separately have prophesized Tammy's death. And this makes things messy and it, it makes me uncomfortable. Um, right? Doesn't it? Doesn't it make you a little uncomfortable? Now, Julie says that she's never met Chad's new wife, Lori, but she remembers the day Chad met her. I guess, um, he sent her a picture and there was all these people in there and Lori was one of them. And, you know, they were like, they wanted to meet, uh, Julie, but Julie's angels were like, nah, dude, bad idea. These people are not good for you. You need to stay away from them for your own protection. So she listened to her angels because... That's how you make decisions. Now, like I said, Julie has never met Lori, but she says she can see and read her energy. And what she sees in Lori's energy is a woman who was abused badly in a prior marriage who got out and escaped. So basically she's alleging that Charles Vallow, Lori's ex-husband, who Lori's brother killed, was an abusive person and Lori had to escape. Anyways, Julie says that when Tammy died, she scanned Chad's energy and discovered that he was heartbroken and distraught. And he couldn't believe that it had happened like that, that Tammy had died in that way. Cause that's not how he and Julie saw Tammy dying. They had seen her dying in a car accident and they thought it was gonna happen a year ago because it seemed so constant that they were getting the same vision, Tammy dying in a car accident a year ago. But then Julie got a message from the other side and they didn't explain why, but they'd said that they'd extended Tammy's time on Earth. The plan had changed for Tammy, and then Julie got a message from Chad saying he'd received the same vision. And he was really grateful that he had more time with his wife. Now, three weeks before Tammy died, Julie reached out to Chad, and she was like, are you still seeing your wife dying? And he was like, yeah, I am. 
but he just didn't know how. And then Julie got another message from her angels saying like, yeah, she's still going, you know, she's almost graduated from mortality. It's hard for me to say this stuff. It's, it's hard for me to say this stuff with a straight face, but I'm trying my hardest. And then Julie had a vision of Tammy's family members dressed all in white, waiting for Tammy on the other side to welcome her. Now, Julie claims that she also spirit travels around the galaxy and she, you know, helps, I don't know, solve cases of human trafficking in all the universes, not just ours. So she's used these abilities that she has to determine that JJ and Tylee are safe. She doesn't know where they are, but allegedly she's talked to their spirits and they said they're all good. They're in a, a nice place that's got lots of sunlight and natural light. They're happy, they're in a living room somewhere. <laughs> they're not on the run, they're not in hiding from anybody. JJ's happy, Tylee's watching over him. She also said that after Tammy died, Tammy's spirit visited Julie and Tammy's very happy. She's in a great place. She's dressed all in white. She's in a great time with her family members on the other side. Julie also goes on to allege that there's moles in the FBI and in law enforcement, and these moles are working with Charles's family to basically set Chad up, like they're trying to frame him. So like anybody else, I have questions about this, this whole thing. It's not my area of expertise. If uh, Chad and Julie were seeing Tammy's death for like all these years, you know, since 2014 apparently, and they, they like to have conversations about it and call each other and be like, are you still seeing Tammy dying? What, what, did they ever tell her this? Did they ever, you know, have that conversation with her? I would be curious to know if they did because if my husband had a vision of me dying and some other woman had a vision of me dying and they started talking about this vision with each other for several years and I never heard about it, That'd be kind of off. That'd be kind of weird. But that's not my only question. My second question is, if Julie has these, these powers or abilities, as she claims she does, to be able to spirit travel and to be able to read people's energies, and she's been able to contact or see the energies of JJ and Tylee enough to know that they're okay and they're safe, why can't she tell us where they are? Not exactly. You don't have to give me an address. Just do you got a state or, or maybe a country? Anything? anything at all. She claims she has no idea where they are, just that they're safe in a well-lit place. She claims the angels aren't telling her exactly where the kids are for her own protection. She says that truth will be revealed and darkness will be exposed. All right, so let's talk about this group preparing a people who are, you know, being called a cult by the people that are involved with this case. Now, like I said, I can't really find out a lot about this group preparing a people besides the fact that they appear to be a branch off the LDS church. Um, and, and that, you know, that's pretty much it. I do know that both Chad and Lori were involved with preparing a people. Um, they, they helped on podcasts with preparing a people has a podcast. It's on Apple podcasts. You can go listen to it. Chad's, you know, done speaking things at their, their, I don't know, what are they called? events. Chad's spoken at their events. You know, they were involved, but it, it seems at this point, since everything's gone down, preparing a people has tried to distance themselves from Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow. They've taken down a lot of the videos and um, podcasts that involved Chad, and they made this statement. Chad Daybell was an author and began publishing books over 20 years ago under the name of Spring Creek Book Company. He spoke at some of the Preparing a People events, but he had no ownership in it, nor was he a founder. Mr. Daybell was simply one of many speakers at the events. His last speaking engagement was back in February of 2019 in Boise, Idaho. Like all of our speakers, we helped promote the events by interviewing and podcasting interviews with our speakers, including, but in no way exclusively, to Mr. Daybell. The majority of our work in 2019 has been contract video editing work for other companies. This has nothing to do with Mr. Daybell. We decided in early spring of 2019 to close out our preparing a people commitments and moved back to Utah from Rexburg to work with clients based in the Utah area, which has always been the bulk of our work. None of this had anything to do with Mr. Daybell. 
While out of the country on a family trip, we were deeply saddened to learn of the sudden death of Tammy Daybell, the wife of Mr. Daybell. We, Michael and Nancy James, own Color My Media and they're preparing a people website. And again, for clarity, Mr. Daybell had no ownership or founding interest in any of our businesses. We were shocked by the reports about Mr. Daybell and the missing children. Like everyone, we are deeply disturbed over media reports involving Mr. Daybell and his new wife, Lori Vallow, and her two missing children. Lori Vallow appeared on some podcasts submitted by our podcast network partners. We learned of the missing children on Friday, December 20th, 2019, along with everyone else via news articles. And all right, this is typical. They're, like I said, they're trying to distance themselves. Um, it's, it's really difficult to distinguish whether this group or anybody involved with the group was responsible for Chad and Lori kind of going off the rails or if Chad and Lori sort of took what they what they learned from this group or some of the thoughts and the views of this group and kind of twisted them into their own little offshoot I don't want to be disrespectful to anybody's religion. I don't want to judge a group that's being called a cult right now. That's that's one of the places where I, I would just draw the line because I don't know enough. If I was allowed to thoroughly research this group, if I was allowed to have access to information about this group, I might be able to make a better determination. But at this time, there's really not a lot out there on this group. So if anybody watching this has some information that you'd like to share, please email me at stephanieharlow at gmail.com. It's also very interesting that according to Julie, Chad wanted to get out of the publishing business, but he told Julie that Tammy was happy with, with the publishing business and, and staying in it and wanted to stay in it. And at that point, because she was CFO, she essentially controlled all the business money. And he had made a comment to Julie and he said, well, you know, that's it though. I'll do it because she wants it, but when she's dead, I'm done. I'm going to be out of it. And like, I get it. You guys had visions that she was going to die, so you knew it was coming, but it's a bad statement to make while your wife is still alive and she mysteriously dies later. Not a good look. Not a good look. So at this point, I'm going to give you some information about Tylee and JJ, and hopefully you guys can share share this video or share a news article. I'll link a couple in the description box, but share, 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 get it out there. And hopefully, oh my God, hopefully they're still alive. All right, so JJ or Joshua, he's seven years old. He's got brown hair and brown eyes. He's four feet tall and he weighs 50 pounds. Ty Lee is 17 years old with blonde hair and blue eyes. She's five feet tall and she weighs 160 pounds. And you guys can go ahead and keep your eye out for Chad and Lori too, because if it's true that she stole $35,000 from Charles's bank account or their joint bank account, like he alleges, or like he alleged because he's no longer with us, um, they, they probably have a good amount of cash to, to stay hidden and stay off the radar for a while. So Lori Vallow Daybell, she's 46 years old. She has a blonde hair and blue eyes and she weighs 125 pounds and she's five foot, six inches tall. Chad Daybell is 51 years old. He has brown hair and blue eyes. He weighs 230 pounds and he's six foot three. Anyone with information regarding the whereabouts of the children is asked to contact the Rexburg Police Department at 208 359 3000 or the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. So my final thoughts on this, um, the whole situation is crazy. The whole situation just kind of keeps spiraling. Um, one of my, my good friends, Gray Hughes, who also has a true crime channel, he does more live streams, kind of like uh, keeping up to date with the cases as they happen, but he's done several videos on this and he's actually interviewed um, Charles's sister Kay and her husband Larry, who are actually, you know, really worried about where JJ is, and they have a lot of information. So I'm going to link those videos. I highly suggest that you check it out. I'm really worried about these kids. If Chad and Lori are responsible for any of the deaths of these people that have mysteriously died, then it seems like they may be um, cleaning house, trying to get rid of anybody who's connected to any knowledge of their crimes. And as I said, JJ and Tylee were the last two people that witnessed Charles' murder who were still alive. And now they're missing, and they have been missing for so many months. JJ's prescription hasn't been filled. There's no activity on Tylee's cell phone. This is pretty horrible. And when two people are obsessed with the end of days and doomsday and rebirth and things like that, the way that Chad and Lori are, my main concern is that they, they may 
have done something to the kids, thinking that they were sending them to a better place and that they'd all be reunited again later. Um, I don't want to say that preparing a people is a cult, but I do want to say that the way Lori and Chad have been acting is cult-like. And I know that these people that I'm talking about, um, these people have a pretty heavy internet presence. They've already been, you know, Julie's been on YouTube uh, interviewing, talking about all of this. All the stuff I got about Julie came directly from her mouth in this interview. And I anticipate that I'm going to get a lot of trolls in my comment section. I'm going to get a lot of hate from these people in my comment section because um, when when somebody truly believes these kinds of things like spirit visions, the other side, doomsday, prophecies, things like that, when they truly believe that so passionately and wholeheartedly, they get mad and they lash out at those who detract from that. It's a lot like Scientology, for example. Um, and that that's kind of what this this whole thing and the, the, the viewpoints and the, their kinds of like their focus, it reminds me of Scientology. The way that Lori got rid of Charles and then married Chad, somebody who was a part of this group when Charles was not a part of this group, the way that Chad suddenly was freed up to marry Lori, Tammy was not a part of this group, Lori was a part of this group, and Lori's niece Melanie married to Brandon Bordeaux, also became part of this group, and then suddenly divorced Brandon and married somebody else from that group, and then all of a sudden, Brandon's life is in danger. Um, it's very similar to what cults do. They don't want you to be in relationships with people who are outside of the group. They don't want you to have connection or really interaction at all with people that are outside the group because their main goal is to keep you in the crazy, essentially. The main goal is to keep you believing the things that they're telling you without other people, outside people, people who have logic and reason telling you that those things are bananas. And that's pretty much what I see here, but I could be wrong. Um, <laughs> Lori and, and Chad could be completely innocent and they're just off on their honeymoon, hiding, while their kids are missing and they won't help and they refuse to give anybody any information on the kids' whereabouts. They could just be like enjoying themselves in Mexico. I mean, they probably are in Mexico if you think about it, but... Anyways, that's going to be it for today's Coffee and Crime Time, but I am keeping an eye on this case. I'm actually going to look really quick like I usually do to see if anything else has popped up on this. I mean, yeah, it doesn't look like anything new is coming up, but I have a feeling that the case is about to explode and break open. I have a feeling that once the police get the stuff out of Chad's house and it's um, examined by a lab, so whatever substance was in Tammy's system when she died, if they found that in the house and they can match it and they figure out that that's what, what killed her, then obviously things will escalate. Um, and, and hopefully, it's really hard at this point to believe that these kids are still alive and okay out there. It's been months. September? I mean, we're in January now. It's been months since they've been seen. And it's really hard to imagine that they're perfectly fine. Um... So if they're, they're not fine, if something happened to them and, you know, we can find Chad and Lori and bring them to justice if they're responsible, then that's at this point, you know, the best outcome, the best case scenario. I can pray and hope and, you know, send out positive energy into the world that JJ and Tylee are fine in a house with a lot of sun and they're just hanging out playing Monopoly in this living room of this house where they're not hiding but nobody knows where they are. We, we can hope and send out positive energy hoping that's true, and I would like to state that I'm not trying to, you know, call anybody out, but the fact that Julie Rowe is, she can believe whatever she wants. She can write books about past lives and near-death experiences, whatever. I like reading some of that stuff. It's interesting. I enjoy it. But the fact that she's now using her gifts or her abilities to talk to the spirit of Tammy and to visit in on the energies of these kids who have been missing for months and then have the balls to come to us and be like, they're perfectly fine. If they're perfectly fine, Julie, what's happening to JJ that now that he doesn't have his medication because his prescription hasn't been filled? So how fine could he really be? Because he needs that medication. I would just like Julie to answer that for me. And you know, I am open 
to talking to anybody involved in this case, any family members, any of the contributors to Preparing a People, uh, Julie Rowe herself, we can talk. I'm open to hearing what you have to say, but I don't appreciate when somebody uses these psychic abilities or these otherworldly abilities to chime in on an actually ongoing case where people have already died and children's lives are in danger. I think it's disrespectful, I think it's a little counterproductive, and I think it just adds noise to a very loud room. Um, and, and it's not necessary. And I wonder if th it turns out that JJ and Tylee aren't all right, and they're not just hanging out in some sun-filled room, how Julie Rowe will feel knowing that just last week she was spouting off the fact that they're perfectly fine and she can sense their energies and all of this. Okay, that's it. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. I really want to know what you think about this one in the comments. I want to know your viewpoints. If you guys have any information on this case, if you know something that I haven't talked about, um, please let me know. Send me an email if you don't feel comfortable putting it in the comments. And um, yeah, we'll be keeping up with it and we'll see how it develops and where it goes. Thank you guys so much for being here. Stay kind and stay beautiful and I'll see you next time. Bye.